Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out here today. I'm Udit Halder. I'm a postdoc at the University of Illinois. And today I'm going to talk about my research. Um, before uh, we start, uh, let me give you a little background. So I'm from India. So I did my uh, bachelor's in uh, engineering, electronics engineering. Uh, and then I moved to Maryland to do my um, doctoral studies. So in my PhD, I studied uh, bird flocks and schools of fishes and how they work. It's a fascinating subject, but that's a story for another day. Today, I'm going to talk about my research uh, here at Illinois about octopuses. So when I moved to Illinois about four years ago, um, I told my family that I was going to work on octopuses. And nobody was more confused than my mom. She was like, you did engineering all your life, and you worked with uh, math and physics. What in the world brought you to octopuses, right? There's no connection. I'm like, yeah, but there is some connection. So, but I never got the chance to fully explain what I do. And um, it was like two, three weeks ago when Danny uh, sent me an email uh, inviting me to this uh, seminar. I'm like, oh, this is a great opportunity for me to talk about my research in a high level so that um, uh, other people can understand who are not necessarily from, uh, let's say, technical background. So I thank uh, IGB and Beckman for organizing this and inviting me to the talk. And uh, I'm really glad to be here. So let's begin. So as I was saying, my parents are here. Was, uh, they were in town, and I was really excited for them to be here. And then it, this photo is from actually yesterday. I took them to the lab, and they got to see the octopuses, and uh, the octopus was playing in the little ball. And then, moreover, they saw some octopus eggs. Uh, you don't get to see that that often. It's uh, it's kind of unique. So I, I guess they had fun. So <laughs> I had fun. So we, we have fun every day uh, looking at these animals. So the question again: Why octopus, right? So basically, uh, I'm from the engineering background, and uh, what many engineers like to do, they like to work with robots. And what are the robots? Robots are machines uh, that are pre-programmed to do some work for you, to make your lives easier. And when you think about robots, so these are the images that come into your mind, right? So what's common about them? These robots are what we call um, in um, technical terms, rigid bodied robots. What does that mean? It, is, it means exactly what it sounds like. So their bodies are rigid, they, are, they cannot be deformed. So they are useful for many uh, purposes, but people got thinking like, can we make robots which have deformable bodies? Then we could use them for various purposes. For example, we could have them uh, in agricultural purposes in medicine, medicine uh, usage, uh, it could insert a soft uh, robot in your body to do surgeries for you. But that's a long way from here. Before we go there, we need to lay out the foundation for this field. This is a very emerging field that will take a uh, lot and lot of research before we actually have our personal Baymaxes, for example. Right? So, before uh, going to the robotics research, we look into nature. So how nature has solved this problem, and then how can we learn from this kind of problems to, to solve um, our engineering uh, applications, right? And inspiration for our research comes from octopuses. So octopuses are very flexible animals. Their body does not have a single bone. Right? Here you see a video where the octopus is uh, playing in the tank and doing its own thing. And uh, one of the most interesting um, thing about the octopuses that we like to look at is their arms. So they have very flexible eight arms. All of these arms are fascinating. So these arms can deform in any direction that you can think about. They can bend they can stretch, they can twist. And they have th this ability to deform at any place. Imagine your arm or my arm, for example. I have 
a rigid arm, for, meaning I have bones and I have joints. So I can bend, I can twist maybe, but only at the bone, at the joint, at, at the elbow. I cannot deform it any, at any location I would like to. But the octopus can do that. So the question is, how, how is it doing that? Because there's no bone inside. All, all it has is uh, muscles inside. So it can actuate those muscles to, to do what it wants to do. So out of all the motions, uh, what we observe, uh, this is the one of the most uh, stereotypical motions called bend propagation. So what the octopus does is creates a bend near the base of the arm and then kind of pushes that bend toward the tip. So we try to understand how this happens, how the octopus is doing it, right? So another thing that is interesting about this octopus's, uh, octopus arms is that if you look closely, on each of the arms are these uh, little tiny suckers. And what does these suckers do? It is exactly what it means by suckers. They suck onto objects. So they can uh, grasp onto things, and then they can manipulate. Moreover, the suckers act as like sensing uh, apparatus for the octopus. So if you think, the suckers uh, on the right-hand side, we're seeing, so what we're doing is we're injecting some uh, chemicals. Uh, in this case, it is shrimp juice, which is food for the animal. So when we present that um, shrimp juice to the suckers, the suckers react to that chemical, and they orient toward the source of the, uh, um, uh, to the source, right? So in other words, these animals can smell through their arms. How weird is that? <laughs> right? So these observations uh, led us to uh, question these following things. So this question kind of drive our research. So the first is, what is that is going on inside these arms? What is the sensing that is uh, the octopus can do? And then how is that sensing information used in their muscle control? So in short, this whole thing is, uh, in technical terms, is called sensory motor control. So sensing and then motor means muscle control, right? So we want to understand that. And then subsequently, the question comes, how can we use that information for robotics? How can we get a principled uh, theory for robotics and then device control algorithms for robotics? So that's kind of. Uh, the motivation for our research. And then let's go into the part. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about four main, main parts. The first is I'm going to talk about what are the muscles inside the arms and how we model them. Second, how we use those kind of muscle modeling to make the arm do something. So we, if we have a control problem to, let's say, to catch a target or to grasp something, how do we use that, uh, our muscle models to do that? Third, how then use these kind of ideas um, to control robots, or how can these be used in robotic applications? And then fourth is, uh, this is my favorite part, is uh, trying to understand what the octopus is doing. What are the sensory motor control aspects of the octopus? So going into part one, so here we talk about modeling of the muscles. All right. So as I said, the arm doesn't have any bones, right? So when you cut an arm transversely and scan it under the microscope, this is what you see. So this is a transverse scan of the arm. So in the middle uh, runs the nerve cord, what we call axial nerve cord, that runs from the base to the tip. Surrounding the nerve cord lies the first layer of muscles. This is called the transverse muscles. When these muscles contract, the arm extends in length. The next layer of muscles is called longitudinal muscles. They also run parallel to the nerve cord. And when they contract, the arm bends. And finally, we have two helical layers of muscle called oblique muscles. 
when these muscles contract, the arms twist. So in summary, so these are the main actuation uh, capabilities of the octopus arm. So on the left, you have transverse muscles. As I said, when these are um, actuated or activated, so it's like squeezing your arm. So imagine my arm, right? And imagine the arm is very soft. And if I were to squeeze it somewhere, the arm had nowhere to go but to extend. So that's how these muscles operate. The longitudinal muscles, they are parallel to the uh, nerve cord in the middle, right? So when they um, actuate, the arm bends. But my arm can only bend this many ways, but the octopus can bend uh, so many different ways. It's almost infinite degrees of freedom. And third is the oblique muscles. As I said, those are the helical muscles. When they actuate, the arm twists, this kind of motion. So that's uh, the basics of the muscles. Now the question is how do we use that muscle to do some sort of um, control task, for example, to grasp something on this video here. So how do we do that? So before uh, going there, I want to talk about some principles. So what have we found about modeling of these things and how do we explain this thing? So to explain that, let me, um, how do I explain this is, let's go back to high school physics maybe. So um, in any mechanical system, you have the concept of energy. So what we call potential energy. That depends on the uh, configuration of any object or any system. So for example, I have this bottle here and so it is resting on the table, and if I lift it up, I have changed the energy content of this um, object, right? So its potential energy has changed. So that's how, how I'm depicting it on that picture here is the energy content. And when no muscle is actuated, the arm comfortably sits at the bottom of the what we call energy, energy potential. So by that uh, blue dot there. So blue dot corresponds to straight arm, nothing is actuated. It is analogous to the bottle here, sitting on the table, nothing is actuated. If I lift it up, then what happens? The arm is bent, so the configuration is changed, right? So when the muscle is actuated, it changes the potential energy landscape. So then, it's equilibrium, what we call the bottom of the potential energy, we call it the equilibrium of that uh, system, is changed. So do you know what happens if I let it go? It will just fall, right? So same thing, if, I, uh, if the octopus let go of a muscle, then it will go back to being straight again. So that's, that's uh, on the high level, that's how it, it works. And that's how any system works, so thanks to uh, people like Newton, Euler, Lagrange, these this, uh, giants in mechanics, they have told us. That's how anything from the bottle to octopus to even the moon, that's how they work. The moon is trying to fall to the earth all the time, right? But it is going so fast, so it's going around and around. Same principle. So now, how do we make uh, use of this system? So what is energy shaping control? So the control, is the control problem is to solve the inverse problem. So now you have a task. You want to go to a target, you want to catch a target. How do you solve it, the inverse thing, inverse problem? So given the task, so or given the energy potential, what is the control input, which I call U? So that is called the energy shaping control, meaning you are shaping the energy, shaping the potential energy of the arm by means of the muscle controls. So this research was published earlier this year in the Journal of uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society A, and um, it was also made the cover of the uh, February issue of the journal, and it made some um, uh, attention from the media outlets, because it was for the first time uh, we um, gave some principled approach to this kind of soft systems. 
that was not done before. So here I show a little video presentation of uh, how this works. So again, so these are the muscle, muscular organization. So you see all these um, helical muscles. And two sets of experiments. First is the arm is tasked to go to that yellow target. And it's trying to figure out what are the muscular actuation it needs to put into to go to that target. Right? The next task is to grasp this uh, cylinder in the middle. And here you see that the suckers uh, sit on one side of the arm. So it also needs to twist the arm so that the suckers can face towards the cylindrical surface so that it can actually uh, latch onto it or gra grasp it. So that's um, uh, uh, what we call the energy shaping control of a single arm. Next, we go on to how, how do we control when you have multiple arms, right? So this research is also, uh, has also come out in the Journal of Advanced Intelligence Systems, and it's going to be put on the cover of the journal, uh, hopefully in the next issue. So this is very recent research. So this research talks about this goal. The goal for the octopus, as we see, it's a cute video uh, where the octopus is kind of crawling and uh, catching the shrimp, right? So the goal here for the octopus is to catch targets while, so you have many targets in your environment, but you also want to catch all of them, but also want to, don't want to spend too much energy. So you want to conserve energy but you want to get uh, as many targets as possible. So it's a hard problem because you have eight arms. All of these arms have these complicated uh, controls. So controlling all of them is, it's, it's hard. It's computationally very, very expensive. So how do we solve that problem? For that, we go back to octopus again. So the octopus is, uh, so I told you about their arms but I didn't tell you about their nervous system. So when we look at the nervous system of these, uh, uh, these animals, it's fascinating. When we look at our nervous system, we have a central brain. All of our computations are happening inside our brain. Not the octopus. It has a brain, but most of its neurons are distributed in their arms. So they have some computation going on in their brain, uh, sorry, in their arms. So what we call a peripheral nervous system and a central nervous system. So the idea here is that the brain is doing some computation, but also it's outsourcing some of the tasks to the arms. So the arm can compute on their own to carry out lower level tasks. So this is how it works. So we call the brain as a high-level controller. Right? So the brain is deciding whether to crawl or whether to reach, uh, reach for targets or in which direction to do that. So this kind of high-level decision is going on inside the brain. And it all the while is trying to maximize how many targets it can get and how little energy it can spend. It then outsources that information to all the eight arms. The arms, what we call low-level controller, they compute by the energy shaping control I was uh, telling you before. So they compute the muscle controls to get to a target. So they compute that locally. They do not need uh, information or any control from the brain. Right? So by means of this hierarchy, we get this, uh, uh, we solve this problem. So here, I show two videos. The first one is a single arm. So you have one octopus, one active arm. The others are passive. They don't do anything. But here, the brain is telling the arm to, so it says, OK, there's four. Let's go. And then, so it first crawls. Then it sees some food. But it decides it can crawl more to conserve a little more energy. So it can get all the three targets at one go. So now that's done, and no more targets in reach. So it needs to crawl, 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 crawl. You know? So it crawls, and then reach more, and then crawl, and reach more, and then uh, this continues. All right. 
I think my computer is having trouble uh, playing the video, so that um, okay. All right, job done. <laughs> Ooh um, next, we extend this to four arms here. All the while, uh, in the arena, now we have obstacles, so it has to avoid the obstacles as well while catching all the targets. So same principle, the brain is deciding which arm to actuate and which direction to crawl and which target to get. And all the arms locally, they're calculating what are the muscle controls to get to the targets. You see here, because of the obstacles, it didn't get uh, two targets, uh, two ball, yellow balls, but that's okay. Uh, this is the best it can do. So that's uh, the story for uh, part two. Uh, going into part three is how we use that uh, kind of idea, energy-based idea in robotics. So before we do anything, we need to be able to understand what this kind of uh, robots or this soft system are doing. On the left, you see this octopus, which really likes the cube. Uh, it extends its arm through the hole on the wall and uh, doing its thing, which is great to watch, but the question is, what is it really doing? So from engineering perspective, what we really need to know is put numbers to these uh, arm movements, meaning what are the deformations for this arm? How much is bending, how much is twisting? We need to be able to quantify that. It is a very hard problem to solve. And before we um, uh, propose a solution, there was no um, reliable uh, solver for this, uh, this kind of problem. So we start with a soft robot. It was easier to work with. So the soft robot on the right uh, has um, three pressurized uh, air that you can put pressure, air pressure into so that they can deform and the robot deforms uh, as a uh, result. So we solved that um, arm reconstruction problem from radio recordings using same energy-based idea. Here is a broad um, setup of the experiment. So you have this arm in the middle, and we put some cameras around the, uh, around the, um, the cage so that we can record the arm movement. And moreover, what we did was we put the markers around the robots, the blue things, those are called markers, so that the cameras can recognize where these markers are. And from the camera recordings, we can know where the locations of these markers at each point of time, from which then we can um, integrate its, uh, or extrapolate its uh, continuous location and the deformations. Well, it's easy to work with octopus, uh, sorry, uh, the, the soft robot because it doesn't complain. <laughs> if we put uh, markers, it doesn't complain, the octopus does. So I'll come to that in a bit. So here are some uh, results for um, reconstruction. So here the robot is bending, and we see three different um, uh, viewpoints. And here the robot is twisting. And all the while, what we did was we reconstructed its uh, deformation, and it's all the location along the arm, and overlaid that on the actual video data. So this was published uh, uh, last year in the IEEE Ikea conference. Okay. All right, so that's what, that was that. And as I was saying, it was easy to work with the robot, but uh, it's a whole different story to work with the octopus, right? Because it does complain when we try to put, on, uh, put uh, something on its uh, arm. So how do we do that? So on the left, uh, we again set up a camera system so that we can record the octopus. But it was very hard to put on the markers. So what, what we tried was uh, we put some tattoos on the octopus arm. So you see here what we're doing is putting some tattoos on the arm. 
so that we can see the arm better in the video. Otherwise, it's very hard to know which point is which or which arm is which. It's, it's a very, very difficult problem. Finally, we were able to, but again, it was not an easy problem to solve. We, we, uh, we solved that problem, but with difficulty. Um, <laughs> but we did solve it, and then, so here's the result. On the left, you see, this is the raw video. The octopus is doing uh, its brain propagation. On the right, we were able to um, reconstruct all the points along the arm and then get all the, its curvature, twists, and everything. So same, same idea as the robot is, is just for the octopus. So this naturally leads to my last part of the talk is how do we use this information to, um, to extract what is that octopus doing actually. So on the left we have, uh, well, so on the right we, we show the, the bend propagation and the reconstructed arm uh, overlaid. But we want to be able to uh, say or devise some sort of sensing and control algorithms for this. Or, in other words, we want to know what, are, what is the principle, right? So here's a uh, little more sensing uh, videos for the octopus. As I showed some of this uh, earlier in my talk, in all these three examples, we are presenting the arm, uh, some fruit, uh, food juice, uh, shrimp juice in this case. On the left, we have an intact arm. And we see the suckers, uh, if you look closely, the suckers are very, very reactive. So they want to try to catch uh, where, uh, where the food is. In the middle, you, so that's suckers of an isolated arm, meaning the arm is cut off from the body. And even then, you can see the suckers are equally reactive. On the right, we have an anesthetized arm, meaning that arm over there, so we put some injection uh, at the base of the arm to cut communication from the uh, brain. So the octopus loses uh, control of that arm temporarily. It gains back later. But in that time when it doesn't have any control, we can see that whenever we have some uh, food near, its, uh, near the arm, it, so we see that um, it's local programs, local sensory motor programs that kicks in. So it has no control from the brain, central brain. It's just local re reflexes. So the question is then, how, how does it do it? And especially all these experiments, this tell us they have some sort of uh, directional estimate to the source from the suckers, right? So the question is how, how in the world they can find the direction? They are only getting the chemicals. They're sensing the chemicals. How they're getting the directions, right? So that's the sensing problem. So that's an engineering diagram um, of that same problem. What we did was um, here you have a yellow target, which is diffusing some chemicals uh, through the air, uh, through the not air, but uh, fluid. The, the fluid is water in this case. And the arm has all these suckers uh, on, the, uh, on itself that can measure these chemical signals. So the question really is, given this chemical concentration along the arm, how do we get directional estimate? And all the directional estimates are local, so all the suckers kind of know where the target is in which direction tar the target is. So how, how, is it, how is this happening? To solve that uh, mystery, we look at the anatomy of the arm. And here's the last bit of uh, anatomy I'm going to talk about. Um, and again, this is fascinating, as I said. Um, as I said, the octopus has most of its neurons distributed in its all eight arms. What's more interesting is that when you look at the, we look at the suckers, corresponding to each sucker, 
there are two set, oh, a set of two ganglias. It's called sucker ganglia and brachial ganglia. So what are these ganglias? So these ganglias are nothing but uh, uh, many, many neurons. They are clumped together, so they form a ball. So when you look at this um, uh, cross-section of the arm under a microscope, they show up. So they show up like these blobs. So scientists call them ganglias. And what we believe is that all the computation, like all the tensor computation, all the motor computation, they take place inside of these ganglias. So in other words, these ganglias, they, they act as distributed mini brains along the arm. So isn't that cool? So you have like lots of mini brains, you have those in your arm, and they kind of communicate with each other and they can make decisions. They don't need the central brain to tell them what to do. So that's how the current understanding of uh, the octopus uh, neurobiology. But it's still a lot of things that we do not know about this uh, animal, especially what are the neural circuits that is uh, inside of these cameras. Nobody knows. We are still looking. But um, from this um, anatomy of these arms, what we have come to this hypothesis is that how do they get this directional estimate? Is that what we think is going on in each of these sucker or sucker ganglia level, they have a collection of neurons, what we call neural rings, that encodes the direction. So what are these neural rings anyway? So these are a population of cells that are also found in many other animals, for example, in rats and flies. People have started to find this in the last 30, 40 years. They have been found in uh, these animals. So th these are sometimes called head direction cells. So what do these cells do? These cells encode some sort of directional estimate for rats. These are called head directional cells. So they kind of act as an internal compass for the animal that tell the animal, okay, you are looking in this direction, right? So they can use this kind of compass to navigate through their environment. So we think the similar kind of uh, cells are very probable. Uh, they, they're very likely to um, be inside of these octopus arms and devise some algorithms for, through which if they had those kind of neural structures, how would they solve this um, sensing problem? How would they solve the control problem? The control problem is to not to sense only, but to get to the target, right? So here is how they solve the sensing problem, for example. So here, what I have shown on the arm, um, you have these circles. The circles uh, represent uh, each of the suckers. And each of these circles are like neural rings. So these are the rings of real neurons. And each of these protrusions, so they kind of tell this, that particular sucker that I'm thinking, okay, I'm thinking the target is that direction. But the, its neighbor might think the target is in the other direction because they don't know, right? They only know some, some value of the chemical concentration. That's all their input is. So they kind of guess randomly where the target is because there's no benchmark. But what can happen uh, is they can communicate with each other. They can communicate with their neighbors. So if my neighbor is saying the target is in the other direction, I'm saying the target is in the direction, Some, one of us might be wrong, right? So we need to work with each other. So by this kind of cooperation and communication, they must collectively con reach to a consensus. So this is what we call a consensus, to where the target really is. All of the suckers needs, needs to agree on a, a common location. So that's the sensing algorithm. And when I play this video, you'll see the target will slowly uh, diffuse. 
and as it diffuses, the, all the suckers will receive more chemicals and they will update their estimates gradually. So, and if you look closely to the protrusions, you'll see there all their bearings or uh, their estimates will point toward the real target. So when the algorithm converges, all of the suckers, they agree on a, com agree on a common location of the target, thereby solving the sensing problem. So now the question is, why do we even care about this estimate? Why do we care about this uh, bearing, uh, so to speak, or the angle to the target, right? So the answer to that question is, they use this kind of information for generating muscle controls. And what is, how is that used is given by the next part of the talk. So this is the result of our earlier work that came out uh, last year. What we have shown is that, so you have this angular estimate, which you call the alpha, that is the bearing to the target. Um, and we wrote down uh, um, feedback control uh, law, which is nothing but a proportion, proportional to the sine of that angle, sine alpha. So this little equation is very, very powerful. That I, I hidden so many details about this, but what matters is this. The muscle activation is proportional to the sine of angle. And what we have seen so far is that this control law is very, very powerful in generating real life arm motions, which I'm gonna show in a little bit. So when this is applied to the muscles, they can, uh, the arm can reach to a target, much like a real octopus would do. So here are some um, experiments and uh, simulation results of that control. So on the left, we see an arm trying to catch the target where it creates a bend in the middle of the arm and then pushes that brand, uh, bend toward the target, right? Um, on the right, we see a similar experiment uh, and similar simulation where we are using the same control law I said, uh, as I said, showed before, the mu sine alpha control so that the arm is kind of mimicking, mimicking uh, the real octopus. Next is um, we have this experiment where the arm is on one side of the tank and on the other side we're showing him um, or giving him uh, food as a piece of shrimp. The suckers, this can sense this food and see how flexible these arms are. They can squeeze through that little hole and try to get to the other part of the tank and get the target or get the food. So we tried to simulate the same thing in, with our control on the right where the arm also needs to squeeze through the little opening and catch the moving target. So that is why um, we think this, this control has something to do with the real octopus because it, and we have compared this kind of simulated arm motion against real octopus uh, motions. And we have found very, very similar uh, results in both of these cases. So what we think is that this is the, this is the principle through which the arm muscles operate. So to wrap up, so these are the contributions uh, I have talked about, and these are the main takeaways from this talk. Um, so the first part, we talk about the muscles and how to model the muscles in terms of energy content, and especially the potential energy of the arm. Second, we use that energy-based idea to control the arm to do some task, for example, to reach. And this control strategy is called energy shaping control. Third, we used the same energy-based idea to reconstruct 
any slender body, it doesn't have to be octopus, doesn't have to be a soft robot, any slender soft body uh, movement from video, uh, video recordings. And fourth is uh, we uncovered some of the unique sensory motor control strategies for an octopus arm. And here are some publications that had uh, come out uh, through this research, and we're still working on some more. So hopefully some will come uh, in the next coming months. And lastly, but not the least, uh, none of this would have been possible without this awesome team. Uh, these are the people who I work with, uh, collaborate with. Some of them are here, Tishian, Jilai. They are here, thank you for coming. And um, I work with Professor uh, Prashant Mehta and Professor Gazola and Professor uh, Gillette. Uh, who has the Octopus um, uh, uh, Lab. And um, thanks to Office of Naval Research for funding our research. And um, thanks again for IGB and Beckman to organize this. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take. Thank you very much.